successful in getting our allies to, even our allies, to do anything very substantial. A few minor sanctions here and there. You put some mullah on the frozen assets list, uh, but it's, it's hardly a serious strategy for pressuring the regime to make a, a, a difficult choice to abandon nuclear weapons. All the way to the back of the room. Uh, Gordon Lubald with the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, President Bush came into office uh, saying no to nation building and then left uh, undertaking two ma major exercises. Now Obama has these two countries to deal with. What, so what is your view of nation building and lesser forms of it in this form of smart power? What is our role there? And, and if the military is too taxed to do some of the things that you might think it should do, does that is that a uh, a good enough alternative. What do you think I think the military should do? Well, I mean, if, if, if there's smaller forms of, uh, uh, if there are countries where uh, a smaller regime change or taking out terrorists or whatever, like Somalia or Yemen, would be a, a, a place where uh, military action might be recommended by some people but can't be because politically and otherwise, or they're just too taxed. Are there other uh, is there an alternative there other than just so we're clear you didn't hear me recommending that uh, because the question seemed to imply that uh, that I was in favor of dispatching forces somewhere no, I understand. no right. yeah I didn't mean to imply and I've grown a little though. weary of that right forgive me uh, by the way I think the military in many places is involved in nation building and more successfully than the institutions that we think of for that purpose like the agency for international development. My impression is that uh, General Petraeus and some divisional commanders have done a very effective job of nation building. When, when Bush the candidate was opposed to nation building, he didn't, I don't think he had ever given it any serious thought. Uh, he, uh, he had a, a more modest view of what the United States should be attempting around the world, a view that was shattered by 9-11. And in fact, if you look at Bush prior to 9-11, uh, you'll find a very conventional uh, uh, approach to foreign policy um, with a strong desire not to get uh, deeply involved elsewhere in the world. I, I remember a meeting with him in which he was stunned to learn that we had a military presence in 110 countries or some number like that. It's highly misleading because that included uh, tiny little missions that were in, involved in helping friendly countries acquire weapons and so forth. But uh, but he he was appalled at the idea that we would be so far flung. So uh, I, I'm not sure I've really answered the uh, the, the question. But regime change uh, does not imply military force, at least not when I use the term. The regimes that have been successfully changed to the much to our benefit, uh, Milosevic, uh, Salazar, Franco, I mean, it's a long list, were changed by political means. Is the military the proper agency for doing this kind of thing? No, I mean, I, I, I think the, the military is nation building in, uh, in Iraq because, uh, because of this specific circumstances of Iraq and because we don't have another institution to do it. Uh, I, I think we should, by the way, and, and um, I've for some time advocated that we have a specialized capability to go into situations uh, after combat or where combat has been averted by diplomatic means uh, to perform a variety of stabilizing functions with uh, with forces that uh, that are trained to do that, including what uh, the, the the whole catalog of soft power kinds of capability, but we end up sending uh, young Americans in uniform uh, because we don't have anything else, and they're not, by and large, they're not trained for that. They're not equipped for it, uh, and it's astonishing how well they have done under those circumstances. Jennifer Sims, Georgetown University. Uh, I want to ask a process question. Uh, we were in the midst of a bit of a firestorm for a while when Doug Fife came to our campus, a uh, firestorm that emerged in the press principally. Um, 
And the critique was essentially that uh, Doug Fife and other neocons, um, <clears throat> in a way, did workarounds around the intelligence community uh, out of frustration that the intelligence business had broken down. When we look out into the future, the challenges facing this country in foreign policy requires a strong intelligence capability. I'd like your reactions to that uh, firestorm and set of issues related to intelligence, and are, are we on the right track now? Well, I, I can't help but observe the irony that a firestorm on a university campus would be created because somebody didn't want to slavishly follow the CIA. <laughs> so, um, there, there's no truth to it. Uh, Doug Fife and the Office of Special Plans uh, didn't go around the intelligence community. What, uh, what Doug did was ask for a review of intelligence that was conducted by uh, a couple of intelligence officers. And that's an entirely appropriate thing for, for a, a thinking official to do. Uh, I remember my own experience and the very considerable frustration with the, the product of the intelligence community. I'll give you an example. Rick will remember this. Uh, understanding uh, Germany in the early 1980s was important. Uh, the CIA reported uh, on Germany all the time. Um, I saw those reports, and I also saw John Vinegar's reporting in the New York Times. And I will tell you that John Vinegar had it right most of the time, and the CIA had it wrong most of the time. So uh, was I going around intelligence by seeking uh, other information? Uh, Doug wasn't, didn't, and it's, uh, it's, it's part of the same mythology about uh, the, the uh, activities of neoconservatives in the Reagan administration. Are we on the right track now with how intelligence has been reorganized and, you know, with the new architecture for it? Yeah, I, I don't think the problem was basically an architectural one. And I, I would yield to people in the room who know more about this than, than I do, but I think there, there was a quality problem at the CIA on the analytic side. On the covert operations side, I don't, don't know very much. But on the analytic side, uh, I was never impressed with the product in all the years that I had access to it. In the days when, um, when I was reading intelligence on, on the Soviet Union, there was a bright spot. The scientific and technical intelligence was absolutely first rate. It was breathtaking. We sometimes understood the performance parameters of Soviet weapons before they did because we were intercepting their telemetry and analyzing it much faster than they could analyze it. It was really spectacular. But then you look at uh, estimates in that period of the Soviet economy, and they were disastrously wrong. Um, vastly overstated the size and growth and effectiveness of the Soviet economy, vastly underestimated the military burden of the Soviet economy. And when you put those two together, uh, they failed completely to understand how close to the edge the Soviets were with that militarized economy. Ronald Reagan understood that instinctively. And a lot of what he did reflected that. But he, he didn't get a lot of help from the CIA in coming to that conclusion. So I, I don't know. I, I think the key issue has been a quality issue. And uh, particularly now, because you know, for a long time, we were oriented toward uh, the Soviet Union. And until quite recently, we still had more Russian speakers than, than Farsi and Arabic speakers in the CIA. And that may even be true today. So we've got, a de we've got a lot of competence that needs to be developed and quickly, and uh, I, I, I hope we do. It's important. Okay. Barry. Um, I wonder if we can go back to uh, Obama and where he might wind up. Um, you said uh, there's a change of tone, but in the final analysis, there may not turn out to be that much of a difference in policy. He's getting an exceptionally warm reception, far beyond a courteous one uh, in Western Europe and certainly in the Arab world and in Iran. Um, do you think uh, do you think that uh, they misjudge 
the amount of change that he would try attempt, or do you think it genuinely reflects a notion that they're going to get a better deal? Um, and you know, we could translate this into the obvious uh, issues, but uh, let me just approach it. Ask you to approach it generally. Does he mean to be different about the Arab-Israeli conflict, for instance? Um, can you tell? You know, I I don't know uh, the depth of his um, of his understanding uh, or orientation toward the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, so it, it's very hard to judge. I think. A lot of the goodwill stems from the fact that people were very happy to see the end of the Bush administration. Bush was um, obviously very unpopular abroad, partly for things he did and substantially for things he never did. Uh, so the change was a welcome change among our allies, uh, for example. Whether they will prove more tractable on the issues between them remains to be seen. I, I'm waiting to see how many of the detainees uh, are European allies. How many of the Guantanamo detainees are European allies are going to be willing to accept in order to help us deal with the burden of closing Guantanamo? Um, I'm waiting to see. I'm not holding my breath. Uh, whether, uh, uh, whether countries that have been in an adversarial relationship with the United States uh, will now moderate their views? I, I, I rather doubt. I don't think um, countries who were adversarial were adversarial because they didn't like Bush and now they like Obama. I, I think they were pursuing what they thought were their, their own interests and will continue to do that. The danger is, in fact, that uh, Obama's much more agreeable and open approach will be misunderstood as, uh, as weakness and exploited. And I, uh, I hope he is, I hope he finds uh, an appropriate opportunity to demonstrate that uh, his, his congeniality is not weakness. Okay, Steph, I think you had a two-figure question. Uh, <clears throat> Richard, uh, you mentioned uh, frustration with CIA and, um, <clears throat> and a kind of, uh, uh, admiration for Fife, Doug Fife's uh, rogue operation. I just wondered what you thought of Cheney's 11 trips to CIA, whether that offered uh, a better cut on the information that was coming your way at DOD, or whether using raw information that way might have been perhaps misleading or difficult. Well, first, I don't accept the, uh, your characterization of Doug Feith's rogue operation. And in fact, uh, um, he has been investigated with respect to that allegation three or four times. And in every case, uh, the finding was that he was not engaged in a, in a rogue operation. And I would urge you to take note of that. Um, as for Cheney's visits to the CIA, uh, I, I wasn't there, so I don't know what took place between Cheney and his CIA interlocutors. But Dick Cheney is an intelligent man with a probing mind. And uh, any senior official who doesn't question um, the intelligence that's placed in front of him and bring to bear his own knowledge, experience, and intelligence is, uh, is missing an important opportunity. Um, I think the president ought to be out there more often saying, how do you know this? And can you prove that? And I, I wish that those questions had been asked, for example, with respect to stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the implication of your question in the context of so much that's been written is that somehow Cheney was trying to shape the intelligence when he went out there. Uh, I don't believe that for a moment. Uh, I started seeing that intelligence. Well, the, it was basically the same intelligence that was in the Clinton administration, as we now know. Uh, there was no significant change in, if any change, in what the CIA was saying about, uh, uh, about Iraq from Clinton to Bush. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't probe hard enough. We sat, and I, among others, sat and listened to the briefings. And I understand how the mistake was made on WMD. You know, we, we knew a lot about what had gone into Iraq. We had uh, 